Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. We're kicking off this season with something a little different. This is the first part of Life Lab, our five-part series about how tiny life can change everything. Life Lab will explore the incredible power of a new technology you probably haven't heard of to solve some of the biggest challenges on the planet and beyond. But with great power comes great responsibility. We'll be asking how this technology could or should change our future. That sounds kind of like a lot to do. Uh, Where do we even start? Well, let's start in the most obvious place. Cheese. Cheese? That's not obvious. (laughs) You'll see. A few years ago, my friend did something really weird with cheese. And I haven't stopped thinking about it since. You were recording a podcast about cheese, and I was swabbing people's belly buttons to sample their microbiome, the bacteria that live inside their belly buttons, so I could make cheese out of it for an art project that I was doing at the time. That's Christina Agapakis, who's a scientist and artist. She's also known as the cheese lady. Wait, so she was making cheese out of the bacteria that live inside people's belly buttons? For an art project? I've seen some weird art projects. That takes the cake. Or the (laughs) cheese. It takes the cheese cake. (laughs) (laughs) As weird as it sounds, this science-y art project made Christina kind of famous. It's more rare nowadays that I get called the cheese lady. I think before it was much more sort of my claim to fame. So not like recognized on the street famous, but more like Venn diagram of cheesemongers and scientists famous. Exactly. I've actually known Christina since before she was cheesemonger scientist famous. My best friend from college is one of her best friends from high school, and we met when she was studying to become a biologist. Christina was probably the first person who said the word synthetic biology to me. So what's that have to do with cheese? What does making cheese out of bacteria from the belly button have to do with synthetic biology? That's a very, very good question. Yeah, I feel like I have a lot of good questions about this. Like, what is synthetic biology? I I really feel like we need to know this before we can get to the belly button cheese. Yum. (laughs) Synthetic biology is engineering biology. Okay, so the rules of definitions are that you can't use the words being defined in the definition that is called a circular definition. Oh. (laughs) Try again. Okay, well, I'll get Christina's advice on how to explain synthetic biology. There's probably a lot of ways that you could do that. You could start by talking about DNA, right? So like DNA is, it's the code inside of our cells. This code is not so different from the kinds of codes that our computers run on. Inside of a computer, there's a code that sort of tells the computer what to do. And computer programmers can change that code um, and do different things with the computer. Right. So I know a computer code is it's like the language that you use to communicate with a computer. And like it lets you change things on a website or build a new app or a game. Exactly. So imagine doing that for a cell using the language of DNA. You can, as a synthetic biologist, rewrite that code and program it the way that a computer programmer programs a computer. But wait, you're not going to like make a video chat app on a cell, right? It's too tiny. That's true. But tiny life can be very powerful to do other things. Well, so what other things can you program a cell to do? Lots of things. For example, you can make a cell smell. Cell smell. You could sell some smelly cells down by the seashore. <laughs> or some or some celly smells. <laughs> Here's how Christina describes it. I would sort of look at what a cell did and I say like, okay, well, I see that this cell over here can make this kind of smell. In theory, Christina could find the piece of DNA code that was responsible for making that smell. Then she'll copy that code. I can put it into a different cell. And then now that cell makes that smell. And so, like, that's the sort of basic idea that I can kind of, like, cut and paste and move around and rewrite the way that a cell works through DNA. That's wild. So it's just, like, copy and pasting on my laptop. Well, not exactly. Working with biology is much more challenging than working on a computer for reasons we'll get into during the series. 
But you can copy paste DNA from one living thing into another living thing and build or engineer a new kind of tiny life, synthetic life. Oh, so that's what synthetic biology is. That's the basic idea of synthetic biology. It's engineering biology. It's a powerful new type of technology that can be used across nearly any aspect of life on Earth and beyond. Whoa. I mean, that's really huge. But I I don't understand how that connects to human cheese because that's just gross. (laughs) Well, Christina was using art and cheese as a way to ask a question about how synthetic biology will shape our future. What if technology looked more like cheese than it looked like iPhones is kind of the question that we were asking. Um, If technology looked more like cheese than iPhones, you definitely wouldn't want to keep that in your pocket. (laughs) Or like put it next to your ear. Like if you had to text on cheese, it sounds slimy. (laughs) But seriously, synthetic biology will change the way we think about what technology is. I think synthetic biologists want to make technology out of biology. Um, And so, yeah, it's going to look more like cheese. It's going to smell weird. It's going to be alive. Um, And we're going to engineer that to make different kinds of food or different kinds of medicines or different kinds of materials and, and, and things around us. Using DNA in factories made out of cells, synthetic biology could engineer the world around us. Things made from biology instead of chemistry. And so that's what technology might start to look like soon, more like cheese. But what, what does that really mean? Like more techie cheese, like cheese startups, tech cheese bros? <laughs> we'll dig into the startling world of cheese tech and reveal a surprising truth about cheese after this quick break. All right, we're back. So at the risk of sounding cheesy... <laughs> this explanation sounds like a single slice of what synthetic <laughs> biology is. And I still have so many more questions. Yeah, there's an entire cheese board of what synthetic biology means and could be. Like you got your hard cheese, your soft cheese, and then there's the cheeses made with all different kinds of milk. You're really getting the hang of this cheese metaphor, which we deeply committed to. <laughs> But just like cheese, synthetic biology is used for more than one type of product with more than one type of method. But get this, synthetic biology is already being used to make most cheeses. Wait, really? Yeah, cheese is made with an important ingredient called rennet, but it's not found in our belly buttons. It's found in the lining of calves' stomachs. Wait, calves like young cows? Yes. We're not going to get into how people discover this inside the stomachs of young cows, but rennet starts the chemical reaction that helps milk solidify into curds of cheese. I have to say, rennet sounds kind of gross and also really not great for the cows. I agree. So back in the 1980s, scientists decided to try to make rennet not from cows, So they discovered the molecules in rennet that were key to that curdling chemical reaction. Next, they found the right code of DNA. And just like Christina described, they copied and pasted it back into a bacteria cell. Wow. So then that cell started pumping out these rennet molecules, identical to the molecules found in the animal rennet. Yeah, so it's basically like like a vegan rennet. But the cheese isn't vegan, though. That's still made with animal milk, right? Yeah, right. And so for decades, we've actually been eating cheese thanks to synthetic biology. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, there's lots of other examples about how synthetic biology is already a part of our lives, in our food, in our medicine, and the things we buy. I mean, I've heard of foods that have been genetically modified or had their DNA changed, And I know people have a lot of different ideas about whether that's good or bad. Yes, definitely. And we'll talk about that throughout this series. But first, we got to find out how we got to this point. And to do that, I turned to one of the pioneers of synthetic biology. 
Her name is Chris Prather, and she's a synthetic biologist at MIT. It turns out I was working in synthetic biology before it was called synthetic biology. How could you work in synthetic biology before it has a name? Seems like you need a name first. <laughs> well, new fields of science and engineering take many, many years of development before they get a proper name. It didn't arise from nothingness. So it wasn't just like a piece of DNA landed on somebody's head and they were like, Eureka, I have an idea for a new kind of science. <laughs> it will involve DNA. No, it came from many different people coming together with similar ideas. And a lot of what people in our field will talk about is whether or not synthetic biology is really revolutionary or is it evolutionary. So what does that mean? Is it something that is radically, radically different, something you've never, ever seen before? Or is it something that represents the thing that you expect to come next? Chris believes it was the second one. The next step of a scientific evolution, which began with a discovery that happened just a year after Chris was born. Yeah, I go back to 1973. That's when two scientists managed to put DNA from one cell into another and create the first genetically modified organism. It showed that you could take DNA from two different sources, put it back together, physically connect it back together, kind of like cutting and pasting, and have it work. Oh, cutting and pasting, like Christina mentioned. Yes, this was the first time that ever happened. It was a turning point from understanding the science of DNA to engineering it. At that point in time, we know the structure of DNA. We know that DNA carries the instructions for how biology is supposed to behave or how biology is going to function and work and all those kinds of things, right? Right. Biologists had figured out how DNA's two twisted strands fit together. It's known as the double helix. DNA is a sequence of letters, but it has a partner. So think about it as being at a dance, and based on who you are, you're only allowed to dance with one person. The DNA dance features only two types of pairs dancing. You have A's, G's, C's, and T's. The G's and C's always have to dance together. The A's and T's always have to dance together. Okay, I, I've heard about these letters before, but I never understood what they stood for. It's the first letter of different chemical bases, and honestly, they're pretty hard to pronounce. All right, well, I mean, I guess I'm fine with A, G, C, and T. We don't need to make podcasting any harder than it already is. There are about a million of these base pairs in any given strand of DNA, and these pairs form groups called sequences. They make up what I like to call the line dance of life. So you have one sequence that has A, G, C's, and T's paired with another sequence that has A, G, C's, and T's. This line dance is very, very long. For example, in our own DNA, there are about three billion of these dancing pairs. Wait, three billion? I didn't know I had three billion of anything. You do, and it's repeated in all of the bajillion cells in your body. <laughs> I gotta say... That's just a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's big numbers. Did you know we're made of a lot of stuff and it's pretty much all wet? <laughs> <laughs> this long line of dancing pairs make up the twisty strands of DNA. These are the words and sentences in the instruction manual for the cell. And to bring it all back to 1973, these scientists wrote a new section of the manual by taking DNA apart and putting in a section of DNA from another bacteria. It's like remodeling the car engine. To put it together in a new way and still have it function, that represented a tremendous achievement that was the start of genetic engineering. Wow, so, so what does that even mean? It means more cheese, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Inventions like the artificial rennet we described earlier became possible. It really just changed how we thought about what we could do with biology and what we could do with DNA. I mean, what, what more could you do? This already seems like a lot of cheese. <laughs> it doesn't have to be just cheese, Marshall. We could do much more. So the next few decades after the 70s just sped up how much we could learn about DNA and how we could make it ourselves. And that's where synthetic biology, or engineering biology, comes in. Oh, wait, what, what's it mean to engineer biology? 
It's using the science of biology and DNA to change up what an organism can do or to make new organisms altogether, which is a bit different from what scientists do. If you talk to scientists, then their driver is what question am I trying to answer, right? If you talk to engineers, their driver is what problem am I trying to solve? Huh. So, so I guess it's gone from like a process of scientific discovery to a process of problem solving. Exactly. That's the difference between science and engineering. But synthetic biology kind of mix and mashes science and engineering together in challenging ways. Chris puts it like this. If I build a bookcase and I come back next week, it's still going to be a bookcase. If I come back 20 years from now, it's still going to be a bookcase. If I build a bacteria and I keep growing it over and over and over again, five years from now, it's not the same bacteria anymore. Really? That, that sounds really tricky. And potentially risky. Engineering with biology is engineering new forms of life. And life evolves. Humans can't change that. It raises all sorts of concerns and questions about what is the role of technology. And just because we can be doing it, should we be doing it? And, and what does it mean to make those choices? And how do we make those choices? These are all really, really critically important issues. That does sound really important. So how do we make these choices? And where do we go from here? That's what we'll find out in Life Lab. In this series, we will explore the incredible potential of synthetic biology to help solve some of the biggest problems we face as humanity. And we'll be asking the important questions about how we decide, how it shapes our future. And that's where you come in. Me? I get to decide the future? Finally, someone's asking me. <laughs> no, no, not you. Oh. <laughs> I'm asking our listeners. Because what comes out of synthetic biology could change the world you're growing up in. Here's Christina Agapakis, the human cheese lady, again. I think it's important for kids to know about science and technology because it is part of how we live that you should know and you should be part of, too. So get ready to be a part of it and come along with us on the next episode of Life Lab, when we'll be packing our bags for Mars. When you're two years from any other human habitation, when there are no plants and no animals and water is hard to come by, uh, you're on your own. And so either you bring it all with you, which is incredibly expensive and risky because you don't know everything that you need, or you use biology to make things on demand, to reproduce the services of Earth, to create things as you need them. That's next week on Life Lab. Thanks to Dr. Christina Agapakis, head of the Ginkgo Studio at Ginkgo Bioworks, and Dr. Cristela Jones Prather, the Arthur D. Little Professor of Chemical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Executive Officer of Chemical Engineering. Life Lab is supported by the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, a nonprofit committed to educating the next generation and building a community dedicated to solving big challenges with engineering biology with funding from the National Science Foundation under award number 2116166. Special thanks to Emily Orend and India Hook Barnard. You can find a transcript and other educational materials about this episode on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. On our Patreon, we have two bonus interviews for you this week, featuring both Christina and Chris. They're available to Tumble patrons who pledge just a dollar or more a month on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. Our interns on this project are Elliot Hijaj and Grace Ingram. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this series and designed our episode art. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I did all the scoring and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next week for part two of Life Lab.